Somewhere in this war-torn city lies a medieval manuscript worth millions of dollars. It is called the Sarajevo Haggadah. Only the Sarajevo Haggadah has this aura of mystery, this aura of special importance, because it has been tried so many times by people who wanted to destroy it, and it always survived. And its very existence has become an emblem for the entire city. Haggadah itself is a symbol of survival here. It survived almost everything. And I know that uh, a lot of people are looking for it. And so Nightline went looking for a book. I'm sorry, it's impossible to see the original of Sarajevo Haggadah. You must be kidding, you'll never see Haggadah. You want to see Haggadah? I don't think you can. Tonight, searching for hope, the quest for the Sarajevo Haggadah. Imagine for a moment if someone could find the original ark in which the ancient Israelites carried the tablets on which the Ten Commandments were inscribed. What a story that would be. Actually, the movie wasn't bad. You may recall it. It was called Raiders of the Lost Ark. The Silver Chalice was not quite as good a movie, but the focus was equally breathtaking. The cup from which Jesus drank at the Last Supper, that cup, often known as the Holy Grail, has become a synonym for any long, enduring search for something of great meaning or value. Since the Last Supper, which Jesus shared with his disciples, was in all probability the Passover meal at which Jews commemorate their deliverance from slavery and the exodus from Egypt, Jews and Christians both have a relationship to the quest that this program is about tonight. So, in fact, do Muslims, but we'll get to that a little later. Our guide is a freelance journalist, Edward Serrata, whom I met in Berlin late last summer. That's where he first told me the story of the Sarajevo Haggadah. There are many copies of this book, but the whereabouts of the original are shrouded in a whirl of rumors. It's been stolen, destroyed, lost, or sold. It is, after all, priceless. To begin our search for this mysterious book, We've come to the National Library that once served the Austro-Hungarian Empire. This is where myths and legends were collected by the thousands. And our book is one of its greatest legends. This is a copy of that book. This is a Haggadah. Now, a Haggadah is the book that Jewish families use every Passover or Pesach to tell the story of the exodus from Egypt. What do we know about this particular Haggadah? Not much. It was in the year 1350 or thereabouts in medieval Spain, Barcelona, that a wealthy Jewish family commissioned an artist, a Jewish artist, to make the book for them. They were able to enjoy it for 40 years. 1391 came, anti-Jewish riots swept the streets of Barcelona. Jews were murdered in the streets, and everyone who could ran for their lives. One family grabbed this book. What happened to it after that? We've got but two clues in the book itself. Let me show you what they are. On the flyleaf of the Haggadah, if we translate the Hebrew, 18 years after the expulsion from Spain in 1510, someone, probably the people who brought the book out of Spain, sold the book. But the buyer's name, seller's name, rubbed out. We don't know who they were. Of course, that means a third party was involved. Then on the 99 years after that, we finally got a geographical clue. 1609, an Italian church censor sent from Rome wrote into the book's uh, last page that there was nothing in it against the church. That put us in Italy. Yet somehow it crossed the Adriatic, probably to Split or Dubrovnik, my guess is Split, and from Split up the Naretva River Valley to a village called Sarajevo. And then it was in the year 1894 we got our first name, Cohen. That's the family who sold this book to the Landesmuseum. Now, Sarajevo was then part of the Austrian Empire, so the Landesmuseum director sent the book here, here to Vienna, where scholars gathered around the book to assess it. And we've come here to Vienna to trace those footsteps and begin our search as well. Two Viennese uh, scholars realized they had a great book, 
uh, they found out uh, that uh, uh, this was the first Jewish book of the Middle Ages with pictorial decorations. And had pictorial decorations in a book, a Jewish book, ever been seen before? Never been seen before, as I know. Is that because I suppose that uh, in the commandments, Jews were said that they could not make painted images? Yes, yes, so it was. And Dr. Marta, have you yourself ever seen the Sarajevo Haggadah? Very few people have seen it. I personally have never seen before. Well, what is it about this book that makes it so great? Well, we're here in the uh, reading room of the Austrian National Library. I can't talk loud or long, but let me show you a couple of things. The paintings in this book, 34 miniatures, are exquisite. Perfect Gothic paintings for their time. The reds and the blues are so rich that we feel that if we close the book, they might even bleed on each other. And then look, gold and copper leaf on every page. The detail is exquisite. But these are the things that make an art historian very happy indeed to, to, to come across it. But let me show you the things that, that I find so compelling. You know what this is? A child learned to draw or, or to practice the number two or a Hebrew letter right here on the book. Well, you can be sure that for this, this kid got spanked. But this kid grew up, grew old, and, and died hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Here's something else I found. On the first page of the service of the family service of the Haggadah, there's a wine stain. Maybe that wine was spilled here, and split, right on the Adriatic coast. A great many Spanish Jews came here. Some settled into the old Jewish ghetto, but others went inland to the towns and villages along the ancient trade routes to Istanbul. The drive along the Neretva River Valley. This is the very same route Spanish Jews took to Sarajevo in the 1500s and 1600s. We know that one of those families, among what little luggage they had with them as they roamed the Balkans, brought this heirloom. And right now, we're following the Haggadah's path into Sarajevo. Over this hill and into the city below, this is how the Haggadah came to Sarajevo. When exactly? We don't know. We do know this. The family who brought this book surely had no idea that their colorful Haggadah would someday become a symbol of hope for an entire city. And upon our own arrival, we set about making plans to try and find out where the Haggadah is hidden determined to go and see it. And everyone was completely optimistic about our chances. I'm sorry it's impossible to see the original of Sarajevo Haggadah, but if you wish, I can show you the copy. It's good, almost as good as the original one. So the question is why? Why can't we see this book? Because it's more than just a book. This Haggadah is an emblem for its city and a heroic struggle not to die, not to give in to overwhelming odds. Haggadah itself is a symbol of survival here. It survived almost everything. It survived the Nazi, uh, the presence of the Nazi troops here in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, in Sarajevo, and I know that uh, a lot of people are looking for it, for its sheer value. I think that Haggadah in Bosnia uh, means a little bit more than Haggadah somewhere else. As you might know, there are other Haggadahs, uh, Budapest Haggadah, London Haggadah, so on. But only the Sarajevo Haggadah has this aura of mystery, this aura of special importance. And because it has been tried so many times by people who wanted to destroy it, and it always survived, I think this is a sort of paradigm for Bosnia as well. Bosnia was uh, several times in its history at the edge of being crushed down, and it always survived. So Bosnia and Haggadah are living presence of each other. Survival, it's the key word here. And no one knows this better than a Muslim college professor by the name of Farodin Rizembegovic, Bosnia's Minister of Culture. I lived in a small town called Stolac. 
in an old historical house. Our family had a great library, and in it we had a very beautiful copy of the Sarajevo Haggadah. Unfortunately, my house was burned during the war, and I was taken to a concentration camp for six and a half months. After I was released, I went to Sarajevo. I walked the streets wearing borrowed clothes, and I came upon a street vendor selling a copy of Sarajevo Haggadah. My family was destitute, I had a very little money on me, and I felt ashamed that the first thing I bought was a book. But I couldn't help myself. I had to buy this book. It may be hard to imagine that a Muslim, just freed from a concentration camp, would have spent his last pennies on a Jewish book. But this book means hope to people in Bosnia, for both Jews and Muslims alike. We're here in a synagogue in Sarajevo that was built in the year 1580. Not by the Jewish community, but by the Turkish vizier who welcomed them to the city. But it's not a synagogue anymore, it's a museum, and everything's been locked away and put into boxes because of the current Bosnian war. But I'll be honest, it's not much of a collection, really. And that's because of the last war. The Nazis destroyed this place. And they stole every valuable treasure they could get a hold of. 10,000 Jews lived in Sarajevo in 1941. 8,000 were murdered. I always thought it would be good to talk to the Cohen family, the ones who brought this Haggadah to Sarajevo, but we can't do that now. Almost all the Cohens were wiped out. Here's the memorial book of the Jewish community of those killed in the Holocaust. These are just the Cohens. While the city's Jews were being carted away on death trains, this German officer, Johann Hans Fortner, went looking for the Haggadah. Not because he loved Jewish culture. He wanted to steal it. And it took a couple of heroic museum workers to foil the general and save a priceless treasure. One day, come in museum, German general, to Director Petrovich, and he asked him, give me Haggadah. Mr. Petrovich told him, Haggadah? Don't joke with me. Why? Asked general. Dr. Petrovich looked straight into Fortner's eye and said, because one of your officers just took it. The general, fuming, turned on his heels and left but his soldiers guarded every door. Petrovich was lying. While he was talking to Fortner, the Haggadah was right there, in his desk. What happened next is the stuff of legends. While Fortner's soldiers were scouring the museum downstairs, a Muslim scholar, Dervis Korkut, snatched the Haggadah, ran through the upstairs offices, and climbed out his own window. Some say he took it to the National Bank. Some people told me he took it to a Serb village. Others said he took it to a Muslim village. And still others said that Cork had hid the Haggadah in the museum's basement. And if you ask Harris Salajic... The Haggadah was saved during the Second World War by, as far as I understand, by a shepherd, a Muslim. Well, wherever the Haggadah was, it came back here to Sarajevo's National Museum in 1945, and this is where it stayed. It was never on public view. It was kept in a vault in the basement. It was very rarely seen. And then in 1992, war returned to Sarajevo, and it was time for another museum director to turn into a hero. I came this way, and, and I found him, but I had not with me key, and I made this by, by force, I took Haggadah, quickly, and I went out. And as the museum director made his way past machine gun fire and toward a waiting car, the Sarajevo Haggadah once more went on the run and once more vanished from sight. As I traveled through this war-torn city, every attempt I made to get to the Haggadah brought one big goose egg after another and I was beginning to think I'd never succeed. I had letters from Senators Biden and Lieberman. You must be kidding, you'll never see Haggadah. I met with all the right people. You want to see Haggadah? I don't think you can. It's impossible. I'll do a number now. But somehow, after weeks of asking and days of waiting, pleading, begging, I found myself in a tiny room in some secret location with policemen 
interior ministry guards and museum specialists. And then I was left waiting for six hours. We have permission now and we are waiting for this. And finally, after presenting all the signatures and official stamps, do you think that bought me the trust of the people in this room, here in a land that has seen its greatest treasures blown to bits? Its libraries with priceless heirlooms gone up in flames? And its cities filled with history laid to waste? Not even close. Oh, oh, come on, guys. I'm shooting nice. my own. Come on. Stop, stop, stop. We had to agree not to show the faces of the Interior Ministry's special police or their guns, nor mention any names. Were they overreacting? That wasn't for me to say. My home, my family haven't been under attack. You see, this medieval masterpiece is the last great treasure in this destroyed land. Art collectors in America, museum directors in Austria told me the book was worth millions. But to the people of Bosnia, it's not the money. It's so much more. In some ways, this book we call the Sarajevo Haggadah has come to stand for the city itself and all it's lived through. And surrounded by guards and guns, Professor Imamovic, as nervous as a father expecting the birth of a child, slowly, carefully, freed the book from its bindings. And by opening that box, 700-year-old treasure was among us. Those pages, can you believe they were made not from paper, but from the finest leather seven centuries ago? And the binding, why, it must have been put on in Vienna back in 1895. And then the first page of the book itself, the seven exquisite miniatures of the creation. And one of the beautifully designed pages of text. And it was over. Quickly, they put the book back in its box, and as the policemen relaxed, they gave me just a moment more with the treasure I'd come so far to see. Well, this is the masterpiece from Spain, medieval Spain. And I'm not allowed to touch the book because it's so delicate. And what do we know about this book? What are the lessons we've learned from it? Only this, that despite all the efforts to wipe it out, to, to chase it down. This book has survived everything. It survived empires. It lived through families who were rich and poor. It traveled across the Mediterranean till it came to a land called Bosnia, where it was welcomed along with the people who brought it. More than 50 years ago, almost all of Sarajevo's Jews were killed, ethnically cleansed, as they say today. But a few survived, and incredibly, a few remained during this war. And it was in their faded pink synagogue that I realized that here, here's where the Haggadah and its message have sprung fully to life. I'll show you what I mean. This is the Jewish community clinic. And this patient, Arif, is a Muslim, a soldier. Now last year, he was wounded in a mortar attack and doctors were about to amputate his leg. But a nurse, Yasna, a Serb who refused to leave Sarajevo, told the surgeons, don't. I'll care for him at my day job over at the Jewish Community Clinic. So Arif the Muslim is cared for by Yasna the Serb inside the synagogue of Sarajevo. The Jewish Community Pharmacy is open to everyone and everything in it is free. In the Sunday school, Muslim children play with Jewish children and so do Serb and Croat kids. You see, because the Jews have taken no sides in this war, during the siege, there were times only their convoys crossed the front lines, and they brought in the mail for the entire city. And when people wanted to get out, Jewish community convoys took 2,300 Sarajevans to safety. 
the soup kitchen. In this city that for a thousand days was nothing less than a ghetto, hundreds of people came to eat here every day. And they were served by Holocaust survivors and their children. And to see this, to feel this, is to know that the message of the Haggadah is not in the words, but in the actions they call for. After all, on the Haggadah's title page are these eerily prophetic words. This is the bread of affliction our ancestors ate when they were slaves in Egypt. All who are hungry, let them come and eat. All who are in need of fellowship, let them come and celebrate Passover with us. This is Edward Serrata for Nightline in Sarajevo. I'll be back with a final thought in a moment. We work so hard sometimes at establishing the differences between and among our respective religions that it's easy to overlook how much we have in common. To find expression of that in, of all places, Sarajevo, struck us as a particularly wonderful way to celebrate the beginning of Passover, tomorrow, and the most hopeful holiday in the Christian calendar, Easter, this coming weekend. That's our report for tonight. I'm Ted Koppel in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good night.